Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? I'm going to get right into this because this video is going to supplement yesterday's video. It applies to the same group of people. We're called to be a warrior. Right away when people uh, hear that word, they get this image of a knight in shining armor riding in on a great white horse to save the day, fight, to conquer, and to win. But that's not a warrior. A warrior is the man standing on the ground with his sword in its hand, and it's nicked and it's scuffed and may even be broken in some places. His hand is bleeding. His armor scarred, scratched, dented, chipped, even broken. Look on his face is a look of mix between depression, sadness, numbness. After going through thousands and thousands of battles and winning a few, losing most. And each one learning something about himself that he didn't know before. Warrior is the one who looks more longingly at death to be released from the pain of their memories than they do at life, trying to find a place to get away from those memories. Because in life there is no place. A true warrior hates the situation, hates their condition, hates the world around them because all the things that he fights for, he realized weren't in one single enemy, but are everywhere. Sorry, things he fights for, fights against. He realizes he's surrounded by them. And even in a meadow with a log cabin on a stream with no enemies, with no weapons, no troubles. By himself, he is still tormented. By every one of those battles he fights. This type of activity, this type of lifestyle takes a toll on a person. It takes an effect, has an effect on a person. Those things do not go unnoticed by God. Because each one of us who has stood in the face of evil, who has stood across the table, arguing for what's right, has stood up for another in such cases, have these emotions, have these memories, <clears throat> have some of these thoughts. Their armor is messed up and scratched up and destroyed. Their sword is chipped and bru broken. And in some cases, they can barely even wield it anymore. Well, we know what the armor is, Ephesians 6. We know what the sword is, it's the word of God. Who's the warrior? See, Jesus Christ was such a warrior because, not because he wore armor or because he fought with a sword, but because he wore the armor spoken of in the word he wrote. He wielded the sword that was the word he wrote. And he fought against the entire world and won. But he bears his scars too. When we see him, you'll see what I'm talking about. He has scars, even on his new form. The Bible records this. Sometimes the fight isn't you standing in front of a wall of enemies and wiping them out and knocking them down. Sometimes the fight is you standing in front of the wall of enemies and just telling them the truth. And their verbal assault rips you to pieces. I've been on both sides of this, personally. And I can tell you that the war you fight with firearms or with swords or, or in other countries facing a physical enemy you can see is far easier than the war you fight for truth. The war you fight standing up for what's right. 
See, that war, I knew who my enemy was. I knew where they were. I could see them. I knew where the attack was coming from. In this war that we fight, we don't. We don't know who our enemy is. We don't know what weapons they're going to use. In some cases we do, but not most. And we don't know where the attack is going to come from. You're almost always blindsided by it. From people you thought were your friends, people you thought were on your side, people you thought were your family. The greatest enemies you have are in your household. Being a warrior doesn't mean being tough. Being a warrior means you still stand when everyone else has given up. Being a warrior means you still believe in what you believe in. You still stand for what you believe in. Even when everyone else has given up. When all the lights are shut off and all the doors are closed and you're the only one left in the room because everyone else gave up and left, that's a warrior. Someone who says, no, I'm going to stay because that's the right thing to do. And even if no one else is looking, you still do it. That's a warrior. Because a true warrior does the right thing, even when no one else is looking. Well, I have a newsflash. God's always looking. He's always watching. Judges 6.12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. This was a man who was in physical war, physical fighting. He was good at it. But something else he had, if you go read Judges 6, he stood up for what was right, no matter what. Psalm 144.1 of David, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. What kind of war? What kind of battle? Well, David was... A fighter. He also fought the fight of faith. First Peter 5 8. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You have to fight him. Isaiah forty two thirteen The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. That's what a warrior does. A warrior is bold, stands up, look, this is what's right, and this is what's, what's going to happen. And I will fight you tooth and nail to make sure that does happen, even if it means my life. We can't give up on what's going on, on what we're doing. Now, to also bounce off of some of the things that I said in the video yesterday, I'm going to read you 2 Corinthians 4, and then we're going to go to um, 2 Timothy. The light of Christ's gospel. I want you to listen to what he says here. We've covered this recently, but this is very interesting what he says here. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Remember, we have it in clay pots. We have it in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We're always going to fall short, but he always supersedes where we lack. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Remember? Remember what I told you? 
seems like people to me seems like people that get closer to god their they their body breaks down more they go further into worse health maybe there's a reason for that because when the life comes the change will be dramatic Verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God therefore we do not lose heart remember in, in the context of yesterday's video therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal powerful chapter and what is it saying exactly what we said yesterday this is a fight that we're going through in what we're doing here. And we are going to be attacked nonstop and it's going to hurt. But we don't lose heart because we have faith. We take those things and we push those things away. We fight them. We get away from them. If we need to take a break, we take a break. If we need to pull back a little to regroup, we regroup. We don't give up. So many people that I've known on their YouTube in the last three years have given up. I don't know what they're doing in their personal lives. But what they started, they didn't finish. I don't look any negatively on them. I love them. I wish they would come back and so we can go full force and attack again. And destroy these false doctrines. Wipe this stuff out. Put these people to shame. Put them to silence. But you know what? The Lord can speak just as loudly through one as he can through 1,000. But my goal this year is to encourage, enlighten, strengthen the brethren. So for Brother Jesse, for all of you, Stanley, Stanley's over there. He's, he's in the middle of some stuff over in India. For all of you who have some form of ministry, we do not give up. We do not lose heart. We keep going. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how rough it gets, we keep going. Because if we don't, where was all the work that we did? If Paul would have given up and pulled back, where would we be? How would that look on him? I guarantee you that if he did, God would have never allowed his writings in the Bible. But he didn't, and we have another scripture for that. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also unto all them, also that love his appearing. I have fought a good fight. What fight was he fighting? A fight for faith. And that's what we do here. Fight for faith. Fight for truth. Fight for what is right. And we may not be able to directly influence the people we're talking to or the people we're addressing, but we can certainly influence them indirectly by living the life God has given us, by being the person he has made us, by doing the things that he has given us. So I don't want you guys to give up. I don't want you to give up fighting for what's right in your personal lives, in your personal ministries, whatever is going on. I don't want you to look at the world and say, why should I keep doing this? This is a waste of time. I do that. I look at the world. I've asked the Lord, Lord, why, why do we keep doing this? Because they, clearly they don't want it. His response, just do what I gave you to do. 
And then he took me to the scripture. When the Lord comes, will he find all of us so doing the thing he gave us to do? Will he catch us doing what he gave us to do? Will I find faith in the earth? And that hit me hard. And I thought, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. No matter what happens, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this at any cost. Because somebody out there needs to hear it. Somebody out there needs to see the light. Somebody out there is looking and can't find it. And then that one moment when they stumble across this channel and go, I found him. I finally found the person I didn't know I was looking for. And the Lord's going to show them some stuff through these videos. And then the Lord is going to put them in a ministry. And he's done that many times through, through listening to my videos and other people's videos. A lot of people have gone off from Jesse's videos and, and done stuff. From Ty Green, from even Jason A. Jason A is showing lots of stuff now. He's, he's a Christian. He didn't know in the beginning, but he does now. So many people have gone out and been inspired by the Lord and trained through individuals. And have gone on and have incredible ministries. You know what it's like to fight alone? I have, uh, I'm in email communication with uh, Dr. David Macarith over on uh, Christian Sermons and Audiobooks. He's in a court battle right now because he wouldn't use personal pronouns. And um, he's been fired from his job. So, uh, but I've been talking to him by email. Um, and it looks like he's going to win this court case. He's uh, He fights by himself. In many cases, he stands all alone. Yet he keeps fighting. And I have been inspired by that. Because I know, guys, I, there's times I've wanted to stop doing this too. Many times. It's a couple of times I've even announced it. And immediately the Lord changes the direction and says, nope, not yet. Here's what I want you to do. And I do it. That causes a lot of problems. But it stirs everything up. And start, it causes people to wake up and pay attention. If everyone gives up and I'm the only one left, I will still fight. I'm not afraid to fight alone, but I would much rather stand with my brethren who fight for the, what's right, fight for the truth also. I would much rather be in this fight of faith with everyone than by myself. And I know how much of a blessing it is to each of you if you fight for what's right and fight for faith in your personal ministries. No matter what it is, no matter what you're doing, no matter what the Lord has given you, that you continue to fight for what's right, for what you know is right. That you don't lose heart, that you don't give up, that you keep going. It, it's going to be hard. You have to resign yourself to the fact that it's going to be hard. That it's going to be rough. And you're going to see things you don't want to see and learn things you don't want to learn. But just like we talked about at the beginning, you're going to become that warrior. that always has that look on their face, a mix of depression and sadness. It has those memories they wish they could escape or can't. It's broken in spirit. Whom the Lord, as the Bible says, is very close to those broken in spirit. But they know that if they don't fight, who will? And so they continue to fight even though they're broken. Even though their armor is ruined. Even though their sword isn't fit for the fight. They keep fighting. Because they know that somebody has to do it. And since it's them and they're already there, they might as well go and get it done. And they're good at it. They're good at it because they've been toughened to it. They're good at it because they know what to do and where to put it. They know what it looks like. The greatest warrior isn't the violent man. The greatest warrior is the man who knows when to be violent. Because not all wars are fought with violence. And one of the great sayings, one of the great proverbs of this world, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And funny enough, if you look at the back history of that particular saying, it was a saying involving faith
We're going to get beat up on this one, guys. This is the end times. I want you to keep in mind that we're at the last days. We're not in the last days. We're at them. The tribulation is about to start. It, it, it's painfully obvious what's going on. For us, it seems like it's taking forever, but it's not. So now is going to be the worst time possible to be a Christian. We're going to catch hell from every angle. And Satan is going to do everything he can to try to destroy the ministers of God, which we are. So I ask you today, will you be a warrior with me? Can we fight together? And I already know the answer. But just know going in, you have to count the cost. You know how, what it's going to cost you. I knew when I went to Iraq, I knew that I went to, when I joined the army, it was going to cost me something. It was going to cost me a lot of who I am. But what I gained was far greater than what I lost. Because what I gained was a new perspective. A new attitude. An ability to be something most people around me couldn't be. So that when they needed that, I was there with it. Because there are very few people that are like that now. People who join the military are 1% of the population. Literally 1%. And I can tell you from experience that most guys, when they go over there, and this happened the first the first 30 days we were in Iraq, the attacks were so bad that a large portion of the unit went home after three months, even more. Some committed suicide while they were out there. Others just couldn't take it. They found out just what kind of man they really were. And of course they came home and talked a lot of trash, but when they were out there, I saw them crying, hiding under vehicles, wouldn't open their door to their chew so they could go on mission. They didn't want to go anymore, so they got sent home. It was so bad that they actually had to bring people out the last four months. Had to deploy people out there to take up the slack. When you get in the battle, you find out what kind of person you really are. And there's no shame in not being able to do it. Not everybody's built for it. And I'll hold no negativity towards anybody who can't because not everybody's built for it. It takes a certain kind of person to be able to do what we do. In the military fighting real war or in Christianity fighting the spiritual war, it takes a certain kind of person to fight this because you will be faced with an onslaught of the most vicious, vile attacks from other Christians. who technically really aren't Christians, but that's a different story. And if they see one chink in your armor, if they, they see one crack in your sword, if they see one moment where you don't pay attention, they will take full advantage of it because that's what they're watching for. And I have had some of the most righteous looking Christians look for that moment when they can take advantage and reach out there and grab it. Basically taking their finger and sticking it in the wound and twisting it around. But what they didn't realize was I was waiting for them to do that. And I turned on them. They don't like me no more because I turned on them. Because it didn't work out the way they wanted it to. Because they want to have the superiority over other people. And I didn't give them that. One of the elders of my last church was like that. He's a blowhard and a braggart. But it was real quick to tell other men how, how less they were compared to him. But did not like to be preached to about the mistakes he made. So me and him didn't get along very well. And I was okay with that because I was willing to stand up for what was right and I did. It will come from the nicest people and it will come from the closest people to you. They will show you a level of hate you could even possibly believe could come out of a person's mouth. Prepare yourself now for it. Prepare your hearts. Be ready. 
The Lord warned us. He told us it was going to happen. The man's enemies will be the members of his own household. That's what Jesus said. I've come to bring a sword. I'm going to separate them out. Well, I got to see that. And it kills me. It kills me that I know it. It kills me that the people I thought that were on my side, the people that were closest to me are my enemies. But I see it. And I realized it's okay. Because there is nothing they can do to circumvent what he has already laid up for me on the other side. And all I got to do is stay the course, finish the, the good fight. And keep doing what he gave me to do. Because in the end, I will stand in glory. And I'm hoping they will too if they listen to these words that he gives us. But they might not. And he shall wipe away every tear. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. We thank you for this word, this amazing word. We've covered multiple spots today. It's an amazing word that tells us the truth. It warns us what to look for, what to be on the lookout for, what to watch for, what to be ready for because of the fight we have to fight. The friends will turn against us. Family most certainly will turn against us. The people of the world, the earth dwellers, those who are not saved, will do everything they can to try to circumvent everything we do and we are. And there comes a time when we have to stand up and push back. People out there who call themselves Christians are in this for the sole purpose of trying to destroy the personality and the presence of mind of every born-again believer they run across. Why? Because they're not born again. They're not Christ-like, and they are not a member of the family. They make it their life's mission to go out there and try to destroy verbally any and all believers they can find, yet they call themselves Christians and consider themselves saved. They will be the ones that say, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. Look how many of these believers I chastised and rebuked in your name. And they will hear the phrase, I never knew you. You gave us these warnings in the Bible. We hear them, we see them, we read them, we understand them. So we fight the good fight of truth, the good fight of faith. Not only faith to, for us to stay in it, but to help others. We share your word with authority and with boldness to tell people, look, this is what's going on. This is what the Lord has said. It is a fight. It is a fight for freedom. It's a fight for deliverance. It's a fight for redemption. And we know that day is coming because our Lord already won it. He's bringing that day to us. Father, we ask that while we're here, you give us strength to continue. Don't let us give up. We have so few people who are fighting for truth, standing up for truth. So few that are, are staying within your word, but instead of wandering and going everywhere. Some very, very good preachers and ministers turning away into fairy tales. And nobody calling them out. But you said in these days, in this last days, when we were right up against the tribulation, you said it was going to be that way. You warned us it was going to be that way. They will not be lovers of truth. They will wander off into fairy tales and myths. They will do everything they can to go anywhere other than towards the light. Anywhere other than the narrow path. They will find the wide path and that's where they'll stay. Because that's where everybody else is. Father, help us to stay on course. Help us to keep going. Help all of us who have these YouTube ministries, we have social media ministries, people that have ministries at home, on the street, wherever it is, whatever ministry you've given them, help us to stay strong in that ministry and to stand up for what's right. I'm watching family members and friends just obli oblivious to what's happening. And they get mad at me when I tell them the truth and when I don't give in to them and when I stand up for what I know is right. But the only ones that are suffering are them. Because they won't. Not because they can't. It's because they won't. They know the truth. They know what the right thing is to do. And they don't do it. And like your word says, for them it is sin. Father, help us to keep spreading the truth. To keep shining the light. To keep 
sharing and helping and leading the best we can. And when the fights come, help us to overcome. To overcome and to use your word to supersede any self-imposed authority they think they have. Because none of us have authority. Only you have it. You are God. You made all this. Father, I thank you in advance that you have given us what we need, that you help us be victorious in these little battles that we have. The war is already won, but these little battles are popping up as we finish out up to the final battle. When our victorious Christ comes and puts a stop to all this, when justice reigns and truth is supreme and no one can stand against it, when there will be no arguments or quabbles or discussions or debates. All mouths will be stopped. Everyone shall be silent and every knee shall bow before our great and wonderful Lord on that great and terrible day when he arrives and takes his kingdom back. Then true justice will be visible to the whole world and the world will respond accordingly. But you have already shown us this justice. You have already shown us what's coming. And so we will not be surprised. In fact, we will be right there with him. Just like your word says, we're coming back with him. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for this word. That's why I thank you constantly for this word. It tells us what's coming. It tells us what to beware of. It tells us what to watch out for. All we have to do is read it. So let us not wallow in our own self-pity or our own desires or wallow in our own sadness or depression. But instead, let us look towards the day. Just like a warrior, when the battles are done and he wants this quiet place by himself, he's still tormented, but he wants that quiet place. We're looking for that quiet place. But we know that in, when we get to that quiet place, there is no torment. It's all gone. It's all going to disappear. And it is only going to be you and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we get to glorify you for eternity. No more pain. No more hatred. No more anger. No more sadness. No more depression. All gone. So this fight that we have now is worth it. To get us to that day. Which, according to your word, is very quickly approaching. We just have to fight the good fight. So, Father, please help us fight the good fight. We thank you for your mercy and grace and great love. We thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for daily prayer. I don't do this lightly. I won't share these things or put these videos together lightly. That's evidenced by the length of some of them. It is worth it to us to learn what his word says, not only so that it helps us continue with what he's given us to do, but it helps us share this with others and show others the truth and the reality of the situation. And when they see our conviction in this truth, it will cause them to go, well, why they really believe this. I need to look more into this. The part, part of the reason why people don't give any credibility to the church is because when they look at us, they don't see conviction of truth. But when they find somebody who is convicted of the truth, it causes them to go, I need to look a little deeper into this because they really believe it, but they're of sober mind. They're not a radical. Uh, they, they, they're well-spoken. So if this person being this way understands this and believes this. I need to look a little deeper into this and find out what's going on. A conspiracy theory is only a conspiracy until it is proven true. Think about that. They say all this is fake and fairy tales only until it proves true. How many times have they told us there are no dinosaurs, and yet they found them? Yes, they found some in Africa. Quite a few, evidently. Alive. Amazing. Amazing. 
They said there were no giants. I remember reading the fairy tale stories when I was a kid. There's no the giants. There's, there's no real giants. And then they find their skeletons. They're all over North America and other places. Tons of them. 10, 13, 15, and 18 feet tall. He's a big dude. If you know the truth and you share that with people and you stick by your guns when they try to harass you about it or make fun of you, somebody in that group will see your conviction and say, I want to know more because I saw the look on your face. You believe what you're saying. That makes all the difference in the world. That's how I, how I look at car salesmen when they're telling me about a vehicle. I look at them. Do you really, I try to see if I get a sense. Do you really believe what you're saying about this vehicle? Because if you do, then I know you have personal experience in this. That's what makes me a good salesman. Because most of the time when I go to places, I end up selling the product without the salesman having to say a word. I did that with the John Deere tractor for my mom. I sold it. The guy never had to say a word. I sold the tractor. He said, you want a job? He goes, because I've never seen anybody sell these tractors like that. He goes, that's amazing. I said, well, I have, I'm familiar with them. Same thing with Husqvarna zero-turn riding mowers. I, I'm trying to think of how many people I've sent down to this one guy we have here. He sells and he's a dealer for him. And I've sent a bunch of people down there. He goes, dude, he goes, you're my best selling point. I believe in him. Same thing applies to the gospel. Do you believe in it enough to sell it? When people ask you, do you show conviction of faith? A conviction of truth? Because that's what's going to get people. When a person goes out there to preach in the street and then gives up when things get hard and people insult them or lashes out, that ruins everything they've done. But when you stand your ground and you tell them the truth, when you stay in the fight and you tell them, no, you're wrong, this is how things are. Because that's what it says. And when they ask you, do you really believe that? Yes, I do really believe that. My life has been changed by it. I can't not believe it. Because for me to not believe it would mean everything that I've learned was nothing. And I can't unlearn what I've learned. So I have to believe. I can't help it. That changes people. Seeing you be a Christian, a true born-again believer, a true disciple of Christ, that changes people. That causes people to go, hmm, there may be something to this. I need to look a little deeper. Something to think about. I love you guys very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I pray God blesses you richly, beyond measure. I'll see you guys in the next video.